The Evolution of Karnak Temple, Part 1. This lecture, originally presented to the Egyptian Study Society in 2017, was re-recorded in 2021 to enhance the sound level. In my presentation tonight, I'll cover how this temple evolved from its humble beginnings to one of the largest religious sites in the world. Here's a map of Karnak as it exists today. As you can see, it's a rambling and confusing complex. I've visited Karnak eight times during the last 40 years and still see new things each time I explore the temple. It's amazing just how old Karnak is. It was constructed between 2000 BCE and the time of the Roman conquest. Walking through the temple, you not only travel back to the time of the pharaohs, you're also exploring a place that took 2000 years to build. Karnak is located in Luxor, a town in Upper Egypt on the east bank of the Nile, about 400 miles south of Cairo. There are two huge temples at Luxor, Luxor Temple and Karnak Temple. Karnak's origins are tied to the worship of the Egyptian gods and their associated rituals. Ancient Egyptian name for the temple was Hut Necher, literally the large house of the god. To understand the Karnak complex, I need to first discuss who this temple was dedicated to and why he was important. Egyptian kings are responsible for housing and caring for the earthly residents of the gods, and significant resources were dedicated to temple construction, operation, and maintenance. Out of necessity, pharaohs delegated most of their ritual duties to a number of priests. In fact, only priests were allowed inside the temples, and common people were forbidden to enter its sacred areas. The daily rituals in Egyptian temples included making offerings. At sunrise, a priest entered the sanctuary, opened the doors of the shrine, and prostrated himself before the god's image, reciting hymns in its praise. He removed the god's statue and bathed and clothed it. Then he offered the god a meal. The god was believed to consume only the meal's spiritual essence. Afterward, the priests consumed the food, and any leftovers were distributed to the local population, an act the Egyptians called the reversion of offerings. Additional temple rituals took place at noon, and then again at sunset. Festivals were held on special days, but many of these celebrations only involved the temple priests. When festivals included a procession outside the temple, the local population would gather to watch and celebrate. These were elaborate ceremonies, as priests carried the divine image in its bark out from the temple sanctuary to visit another site. Called Wea in ancient Egyptian, a bark is a model boat which held the statue of the god. The modern day town of Luxor was called by the ancient Egyptians Waset, the city of the scepter. The ancient Greeks called it Thebai, the city of a hundred gates, and it became known to the classical writers as Thebes. The city's modern name of Luxor comes from the Arabic al qasur meaning the palaces. During ancient times, the Egyptians often referred to the city as Nut Amun, or the city of Amun. Originally, Amun was just one of the gods worshipped around Luxor. He was often called the Hidden One. By the New Kingdom, however, Amun had become the city's patron deity. After the expulsion of the Hyksos invaders, the 18th dynasty kings from Thebes reunited Egypt. These new kingdom pharaohs attributed their victory to the blessings of Amun, and this previously local god assumed national importance. Temples dedicated to Amun were expanded, and riches were bestowed upon Amun's priesthood. As Amun's cult grew, he was merged with Ra, the chief god in other parts of Egypt, becoming Amun-Ra, who was shown by the addition of a sun disk after his name, and a disc added to his plumed headdress. New Kingdom conquests into the land of Cush also revealed the Nubians worshipped a ram-headed sun god. This idea took hold in Egypt, and Amun-Ra became symbolized by a ram. By the Middle Kingdom, Amun's wife Mut, whose name means mother, had assumed the ferocious aspects of a feline goddess. That's why she's often depicted with a lion's head. Amun, Mut, and Khonsu are often called the Theban Triad. Opet, or Ipet, was a protective goddess personified as a hippopotamus. Her name means the nurse. In Theban creation myths, 
Opet was the original wife of Amun. By the New Kingdom, Opet had become the local city goddess of Thebes. Please note that Opet is a different goddess than Tawaret, another hippopotamus, who was the protector of childbirth. During the New Kingdom, the annual Opet festival was held to celebrate the marriage of Amun and Mut, as by then Mut had taken on Opet's attributes. Held on the 15th day of the second month of the flood season, the statues of Amun, Mut, and their son Khonsu made the ritual journey from their shrines at Karnak to Luxor Temple. Depictions of bark processions show that a variety of people participated in the Opet festival. During the parade, soldiers, dancers, musicians, and singers marched alongside the statues of Amun, Mut, and Khonsu. Rattling Sistra, clapping, chanting, and singing would have created a very festive atmosphere, kind of an Egyptian Mardi Gras. It was party time. Between the Karnak and Luxor temples are six shrines that were used during the Opet festival. These small buildings had a central altar in which the god's bark was placed so that the priests could rest while the god received offerings before moving on to the next shrine. How can you tell this is the bark of Amun-Ra? Well, you can either read the hieroglyphs, Amun-Ra, Lord of the Sky, or notice the ram's heads at the front and back of the bark. The illustration on the right shows the bark of Amun arriving at Luxor Temple, carried by priests into the holy sanctuary. On the left is a photo of the bark of the god Horus, sitting in front of his shrine in the Holy of Holies at Edfu Temple. In the sanctuary, each god's statues rested and received tribute in their own naos. A naos is a cabinet-like structure which houses the statue of the god. The statues remained at Luxor Temple for 24 days, during which time the entire city celebrated. And then the triad journeyed by river back to Karnak. Now, Let's take a closer look at Karnak Temple. It has a complex history because many pharaohs added structures and renovated and moved walls, columns, and buildings. In addition, kings often usurped the work of previous pharaohs, erasing their names and adding the new king's cartouche to existing scenes and structures. Although the main temple at Karnak is dedicated to Amun, there are subsidiary temples nearby, dedicated to his wife Mut, their son Khonsu, and another local god, Montu. The Temple of Amun is enormous, covering about 90 acres. The three precincts together cover 750 acres, more than a square mile. The ancient Egyptians called the huge temple dedicated to Amun-Ra, Ipet Suet. Many references translate this name as the most select of places, but I think a better translation is Opet Sanctuary. The Arabs called the temple Karnak, which means fortified village, probably because they found people living behind the walls of Karnak Temple when they first invaded Egypt. This is the Karnak Temple model, which is on display in the visitor's center. To make it easier to visualize which way we are facing on my photos and drawings, I have added arrows to most of my slides. The white arrows point eastwards from the Nile inward towards the temple sanctuary and the yellow arrows point outward along the south processional way to Luxor Temple. To the ancient Egyptian, the pylons of a temple represented a symbolic horizon separating the real world from the sacred spaces inside the temple. Ancient Egyptian word for pylons, bekent, ends with the hieroglyphic determinative, aket. It represents the sun setting between two hills on the horizon, symbolizing the boundary between the earthly existence and the afterlife. Today, Karnak's pylons are numbered one through six from its main entrance by the Nile towards the temple central sanctuary. Pylons seven through 10 lie along the south processional way to the precinct of Mood and then onward to Luxor Temple. This numbering system, while useful for tour guides, is not the order in which the pylons were built. I know many of you have been to this fantastic temple complex and are already familiar with some of its various parts but hopefully I can help you gain a better understanding of this confusing labyrinth of pylons, shrines, and courtyards by starting at the beginning of its development and then working our way forward chronologically through time. I'll cover this in detail as we explore the temple, but here's a list of kings who built at Karnak in the Middle and New Kingdoms. And those who built in the Third Intermediate, 
late and Macedonian and Greek periods. During the rest of my talk, we'll cover each of these kings' construction at Karnak one by one. So let's begin exploring how the temple evolved over time. Drill core samples around Karnak show it was originally located on an island. First, the eastern channel dried up. And then the remaining channel slowly migrated westward, so many walls and pylons could be added in a westerly direction. The earliest object found with the king's name at Karnak is this eight-sided column of the Middle Kingdom pharaoh Intef II, dedicating some kind of monument to the god Ra. It's now on display in the Luxor Museum. Construction dedicated to Amun, however, probably began with the Middle Kingdom pharaoh Sinusra I, who built the earliest complete structure at Karnak that has been found. Sinusra built a central sanctuary, the White Chapel, and an enclosure wall and gate. As I outline the stages of construction at Karnak, I'll highlight on this map each king's additions in red and text boxes colored yellow will signify each pharaoh's major achievements. Also, please note that on the map of Karnak I am using, north is to your left, south is to your right, east is toward the top, and west is toward the Nile River at the bottom. Here's a reconstruction of what Karnak looked like during Sinusrit's reign. Again, remember to look for the arrows on each slide to see which direction we are facing. White arrows point toward the sanctuary and yellow arrows point toward Luxor Temple. Modern excavations have uncovered small portions of Sinusrit's mud brick wall, three red granite door sills, and a large calcite altar. These are the only traces of his structures that remain today in the mostly empty space at the heart of the temple. The 17,000 square foot Middle Kingdom temple originally had 12 colossi of Sinusrit standing in front of square pillars. This statue of Sinusrit was found in the foundation of Karnak's much later sixth pylon and is now on display in the Cairo Museum. Sinusrit's central sanctuary contained a bark shrine with a naos for the statue of Amun. Later destroyed, sections of its walls were found inside Karnak's ninth pylon. The White Chapel is the earliest building we now have at Karnak. It was built to celebrate Sinusrit's Heb Sed Jubilee. The Heb Sed was a ceremony commemorating the king's 30 year of rule. It was celebrated every three years thereafter. The White Chapel did not survive intact, but was found dismantled and recycled as filler inside Karnak's third pylon. The White Chapel has now been reassembled and is on display in the open air museum located next to Karnak Temple. It was 400 years later that the next king built at Karnak. He was Amenhotep I, the second pharaoh of the New Kingdom's 18th dynasty. Amenhotep I modified the inner courtyard, added a limestone wall, an alabaster bark shrine, and just in front of the temple's entrance, a limestone chapel. Like Sinusrit's earlier white chapel, these structures were later dismantled and used as fill for that third pylon. Remember, those pylon numbers just refer to the order modern tourists see them when walking through the temple. Here's what Karnak looked like during Amenhotep I's reign. As I show 3D views of the temple, just imagine yourself being escorted through the temple gates and into the sanctuary. With each successive king, it just gets better. By the way, the reconstructions I am using came from UCLA's Digital Karnak Project. Amenhotep I's alabaster bark shrine was, of course, the place where the sacred bark was parked in the temple. It probably replaced Sinusrit's earlier structure. Amenhotep tells us that, and I quote, the leaves of its doors are a single piece of Asiatic copper, and the figures on its doors are made of gold, end quote. Amenhotep's alabaster bark shrine has also been reassembled in the open air museum, but sadly its doors no longer exist and the shrine is now open at both ends. Its ceiling is covered with stars and scenes on both the inside and outside show the king and his successor participating in temple festivals. Amenhotep I also built a limestone copy of Sinusrit's white chapel as a tribute to his ancestor, who he had much admired. The two chapels sat together in front of the original entrance to Karnak Temple. 
Thutmose the first succeeded Amenhotep the first. He had previously commanded Egypt's army. During his reign, this warrior king expanded Egypt's empire from the Euphrates River in the north to the fourth cataract of the Nile in Nubia to the south. He used the rich tribute that flowed in from the foreign lands to finance his construction of Karnak to honor Amun for granting Thutmose his military victories. Thutmose erected the very first pylon built at Karnak, now called the fifth pylon, which created a new Eastern courtyard behind the pylon. And he erected a sandstone enclosure wall around the entire Middle Kingdom temple. Thutmose's later construction, which I will show with a blue background, added the Wajed Hall in front of the fifth pylon, another pylon on the west side of the temple, now called the fourth pylon, and a pair of obelisks. He kept his builders pretty busy. On the east face of Thutmose's fifth pylon, 10 foot tall Osirite statues at Thutmose I were placed. Fluted sandstone columns were also installed to create a covered portico in front of the statues. Very little of these additions remain, except ruined statues and column bases. During his later construction, Thutmose I extended the temple toward the Nile River by building his larger fourth pylon. This created the Wajed Hall, and in front of the fourth pylon, Thutmose placed two obelisks. Adorning his large fourth pylon were flagpoles of Lebanese cedar. Their tops were covered in electrum, an alloy of silver and gold. The pylon's huge doors were made of copper with the divine image of the god inlaid in gold. The fourth pylon was massive enough to accommodate two chambers in its thickness with a staircase leading to its top. The court that was formed between the fourth and fifth pylons called the Wajed Hall became the main court of the temple. Later, Hatshepsut removed its wooden ceiling and erected two obelisks in this space. The Wajed Hall was used for coronation and Hepzed ceremonies until the 19th dynasty, when these activities were moved to Seti I's hypostyle hall. The statues of Thutmose I, which now stand by Hatshepsut's obelisks in the Wajed Hall, originally stood in Thutmose's courtyard built east of the fourth pylon. The statues were the red crown of the north in the northern part of the court, and the white crown of the south in the southern part of the court. West of the fourth pylon, in front of the temple's original entrance, Thutmose I erected two red granite obelisks on either side of the great doors. These were the first obelisks placed at Karnak. The southern one still stands today, but the other one fell about 300 years ago. An inscription on the standing obelisk says its pyramid-shaped cap was encased with electrum. Thutmose II was the son of Thutmose I, who was probably only about 17 years old when he became king. This king only reigned a few years, but during that time he built a festival court and a new pylon to the west of his father's fourth pylon. Thutmose II's new pylon and its festival court created a new western entrance to the temple and it linked the north-south and east-west processional routes. His construction enclosed the obelisks of Thutmose I, the White Chapel of Sinusra I, and the Limestone Chapel of Amenhotep I. Thutmose II's new pylon was later destroyed, and its blocks were used as fill for that famous, but not yet built, third pylon. Hatshepsut was the daughter of Thutmose I. At 12 years of age, she married her half-brother, Thutmose II, and became queen of Egypt. When Thutmose II died unexpectedly a few years later, kingship passed to his two-year-old son, Thutmose III. Since Thutmose III was too young to rule alone, his stepmother, Hatshepsut, was named as co-regent. Seven years later, Hatshepsut switched roles with the young king, named herself as pharaoh and her ward as co-regent. Significant building projects at Karnak were completed during Hatshepsut's reign. The eighth pylon, the Palace of Ma'at, the Red Chapel, and an amazing six obelisks were erected. The eighth pylon was located along the south processional way toward Luxor Temple. Hatshepsut moved the alabaster bark shrine built some 50 years before by Amenhotep I 
from the central area of the temple to a position near her new pylon. In its place, she erected her own bark shrine, the Red Chapel. Hatshepsut's Red Chapel was a beautiful red quartzite building placed just in front of the sanctuary of the Amun Ra Temple. This hard to work stone was normally only used for sarcophagi and statues. The chapel was dismantled after Hatshepsut's reign, and its blocks were used in other building projects, including, of course, as fill for that third pylon. Thankfully, the Red Chapel has been reconstructed in the Open Air Museum. The carved relief decoration on the chapel's exterior included scenes of the Opet Festival. Some scholars believe that the Opet Festival procession began during Hatshepsut's reign. Hatshepsut's Palace of Ma'at consisted of a series of small rooms with a large central hall. It was located just behind the Red Chapel. On the right is the plan of the inner temple area during Hatshepsut's reign. The Palace of Ma'at provided an enclosed storage space for the cult of Amun. Eight of its rooms had been preserved, one of which had a stairway that led to an upper floor or roof. The walls of the Palace of Ma'at were covered with carved and painted relief scenes of Hatshepsut and Tutmos III, like this scene from the Red Chapel. Other reliefs show King Hatshepsut celebrating her Hepsed Jubilee and offering to each of the nine creation gods of Thebes. The pylon constructed by Hatshepsut, now called the Eighth Pylon, was the first of four pylons built along Karnak's South Processional Way. Her original decoration is now mostly lost. However, the remains of six colossal statues are in front of the pylon's southern face. The best preserved statues represent Amenhotep I and Tutmos II. Another of the statues may have been carved for Hatshepsut, but then later usurped by Tutmos III. A pair of obelisks that had been commissioned by Tutmos II were erected by Hatshepsut in Tutmos II's festival court in front of the fourth pylon. Raising an obelisk seems like an enormous challenge, and yet Hatshepsut had six obelisks erected at Karnak during her reign. Modern efforts to raise a small obelisk show just how amazing these accomplishments were. Hatshepsut also erected another pair of obelisks in the old Wajet Hall, which had been built by her father, Tutmos I. Hatshepsut's northern obelisk in the Wajet Hall is still standing today. However, the southern Wajet Hall obelisk fell and only its tip is on display at Karnak. This scene from the Red Chapel describes the erection of Hatshepsut's two obelisks in the Wajet Hall. Obelisks are called Tekken in the ancient Egyptian language. Hatshepsut erected a third pair of obelisks east of Karnak Temple. The raising of these obelisks was overseen by Senenmut, an important official during her reign shown here holding Hatshepsut's daughter, Nefer-Ure. Inscriptions claim these obelisks were covered in gold. But today, here's all that's left of Hatshepsut's eastern obelisks. Thomas III had to wait 21 years after his father died to become the sole ruler of Egypt. During that time, he first trained for and then later commanded Egypt's army. Then, during his second year as sole ruler, Tutmos led his army off to war. He is recorded to have captured 350 cities and conquered much of the Near East during 17 military campaigns. This earned him the title of the Napoleon of Ancient Egypt. During Tutmos III's reign, Karnak was expanded by 50%. His additions included a new central bark shrine, the Ak Menu, the King's Corridor and Stations, the Contra Temple, the Sixth Pylon, the Seventh Pylon, a bark shrine by the Seventh Pylon, Tutmos's annals, an exterior wall, excavation of the Sacred Lake, the Temple of Ptah, a new roof on the Wajet Hall, and would you believe the erection of six more obelisks? He was a busy guy, or at least his builders were. Thomas III dismantled Hatshepsut's Red Chapel and in its place added a new central shrine. In the tomb of Pu Emre, overseer of Karnak during Thutmose III's reign, 
is a list of offerings given by the king to the temple treasury. Included are two obelisks. The inscriptions state they were made of electrum and laid with lapis lazuli. In later scenes at Karnak, these 23 foot high obelisks are shown on either side of the temple doors leading to the central shrine. Confirming the existence of these amazing obelisks, Asher Banipal stated that when he sacked Thebes in 656 BCE, and I quote, I removed two great obelisks of pure electrum weighing 80 tons, end quote. In today's money, the metal alone would be worth more than $1.5 billion. Ah, the spoils of war. Originally built to celebrate Tutmos III's Heb said Jubilee, the Akmanu, or Monument to the Living Spirit, was constructed behind the Middle Kingdom court. The buildings consisted of three main parts. First, rooms dedicated to Sokar, the falcon-headed god of Memphis. Second, a chamber listing the previous kings of Egypt. And third, a room listing botanical plants and animals. Inscriptions tell us the Akmanu was once adorned with gold, silver, electrum, lapis lazuli, and turquoise decorations. It would have been really impressive. Here's the Akmanu's kings list. It listed the names of 61 kings, beginning with the second dynasty king, Neferkare, followed by the old kingdom pharaoh, Sneferu. But today only 39 of the names are still legible. Included, however, are kings of the first and second intermediate periods. These are areas colored white can no longer be read. King 24 on this list, is our friend Sinisret I, whose throne name was Keper Ka Ra, the pharaoh who seems to have been the first to have built at Karnak. The botanical collection carved on the walls of the Akmanu represented the exotic flora and fauna that Tutmos's army found during his foreign campaigns. Tutmos III also built a long corridor called the King's Corridor from the Wajet Hall in the court of the fifth pylon to the southwest entrance of his Akmanu temple. A series of rooms in a small chapel called the Stations of the King lined the corridor on its south side. The functions of these rooms is uncertain. When excavated in modern times, one room was found filled with black granite statues of a lion-headed goddess, perhaps a manifestation of moot. Another feature added by Tutmos III was the Contra Temple, constructed behind the Akmanu and sandwiched between Hatshepsut's two eastern obelisks. Tutmos had Hatshepsut's name erased from the obelisk surrounding his Contra temple. These obelisks may have fallen on their own, or perhaps were later pulled down intentionally. The Contra temple was a place to worship Amun for those who were not allowed to enter Karnak's temple's sacred spaces. Known as the Chapel of the Hearing Ear, this shrine allowed ordinary people to petition Amun-Ra directly. This fragment in University College Museum in London shows a woman praying to the hearing ears. Thomas III also erected two pylons, now called the sixth and seventh pylons. The sixth pylon is the last pylon passed through before reaching the Palace of Ma'at and the central sanctuary. On both sides of Thutmose's seventh pylon, the first one entered along the South Processional Way, are relief scenes showing Tutmos III smiting a group of cowering captives. Just north of the seventh pylon, in the courtyard between the pylon and the wall of the inner temple, a cache of statues was found. These statues shown here were found in the cachette. The cachette was excavated in 1905 using shadus to lift up the statues. Included in the find were 751 statues in stela and 17,000 bronze figurines. These artifacts dated from the archaic period all the way through Ptolemaic times. They were hidden, it is assumed, to free up space after Karnak was overflowing with votive objects. Indeed, the papyrus had Harris mentions that by the 20th dynasty, there were over 86,000 statues standing in Karnak temple. Talk about crowded, wow. A bark shrine of Tutmos III known as the Shrine of the Lake, was located next to his seventh pylon. The Shrine of the Lake served as a way station for the Bark of the God when it came out to sail on the sacred lake. The shrine was later demolished and used as fill, you guessed it, for that ubiquitous third pylon. 
Tutmos III's sacred lake was used during religious festivals and for the enjoyment of the geese of Amun. Egyptian geese, like these pictured in an old kingdom tomb, were sacred to Amun. Tutmos III wrote, and I quote, I form for Amun flocks of geese to fill the sacred lake for daily offerings. I gave two fattened geese each day in payment to my father Amun, end quote. There's at least 20 minor temples at Karnak. One of the largest is the Temple of Ptah, located beside Karnak's north enclosure wall. It was built by Tutmos III and later enlarged by Pharaohs Ptolemy III and IV. To celebrate his Hebsed, Tutmos III erected two more obelisks in the festival court. They were squeezed in between those of his father, Tutmos II, and his grandfather, Tutmos I. Of this forest of six obelisks, only the southern obelisk of Tutmos I has survived. Here's another view of Tutmos I's standing southern obelisk in what's left of the festival court that was built by Tutmos II. Only the bases of Tutmos III's obelisk remain today. South of the seventh pylon, on the south processional way toward the Luxor Temple, Tutmos III erected another pair of obelisks. The Western one was removed for the Holy Roman Emperor Constantine in the fourth century, and it now resides in Istanbul. The Eastern obelisk was destroyed in antiquity and only its tip remains on display at Karnak. On the Palace of Baat's North Wall, Tutmos III is shown standing in front of a list of offerings he's given to Amun. There are two flagpoles and two obelisks between the king and his offerings. Inscription says these obelisks are the ones in front of the seventh pylon. Below, the annals of the king's military campaigns are recorded, including the story praising Tutmos's genius in taking an alternate route to Megiddo, outsmarting his enemies who expected him to approach from a different direction. He states that unlike the usual pharaonic boasting, he himself has not uttered any exaggeration of his achievements. Yeah, right. Finally, Tutmos III commissioned the largest obelisk that would be raised at Karnak. Since obelisks are normally placed in pairs, the kings wrote that it would be, and I quote, the very first time a single obelisk would be erected in Thebes, end quote. Like the unfinished obelisk of Hatshepsut in this picture, it was quarried at Aswan. Fortunately, Tutmos III died before it was finished and his unique obelisk was not erected until the reign of his grandson, Tutmos IV. Amenhotep II, II was the son of Tutmos III. Because his father had completed so many projects at Karnak, Amenhotep II spent most of his energy enhancing other temples around Egypt. He reworked a few areas at Karnak, but little remains except an alabaster shrine, added decoration on Hatshepsut's eighth pylon, and an edifice along the south processional way. The alabaster shrine of Amenhotep II was a small structure with a roof and a single entrance door. It was located in Tutmos II's festival court, just west of the fourth pylon. The shrine was later dismantled and part of it used as fill for the third pylon. I think we see a pattern here. Amenhotep II's re reconstructed alabaster shrine is currently in the open air museum. On the south face of Hatshepsut's eighth pylon, Amenhotep II added a scene showing him smiting his enemies. And on the north face are scenes of Amenhotep watching the Opet Festival Bark go by on its way to Luxor Temple. The edifice of Amenhotep II is the name given to a low building with pillared facade that's now located along the south processional way. Originally part of a Heb Sed festival court built by Amenhotep II between the seventh and eighth pylons, the edifice was later removed by Horemheb to its present location between the yet to be built ninth and 10th pylons. According to the Papyrus Harris, Amun's temples at Thebes were adorned with 433 gardens. This illustration of one of Amun's gardens at Karnak was found in the tomb of Senefer. He was mayor of Thebes and overseer of the gardens of Amun during the reign of Amunhotep II. Inscriptions found near Karnak's temple entrance tell us that, and I quote, Amenhotep II has made a cool and holy place 
decorating it with a pool adorned with reeds and planted with sedges, herbs, rushes, and lotus buds, end quote. Just picture the ruins we see today, festooned with flowers, trees, and ponds. Thomas IV was the son of Amenhotep II. He was not the crown prince, however, and some Egyptologists speculate he did away with his older brother to be next in line to be king. Here he's shown wearing the kepresh, also known as the blue crown, was frequently shown in battle scenes. He's best known for his dream stela, left between the paws of the great Sphinx at Giza. During his 10-year reign, Thutmose IV erected an obelisk called the Unique Obelisk and built the Peristyle Hall and Chapel in front of the fourth pylon as a place for common people to worship since they weren't allowed inside the main temple. Thutmose IV erected the obelisk of his grandfather, Thutmose III, had quarried years before. Nicknamed the Unique Obelisk, it was the 11th obelisk installed at Karnak. The Unique Obelisk was placed just east of the Contra Temple. It stood at Karnak until 330 CE, when the Holy Roman Emperor Constantine ordered it moved to Rome. Now known as the Lateran Obelisk, at 107 feet high, was probably the largest obelisk ever raised at Karnak. Tutmos IV's Peristyle Hall and Chapel were built in the festival court but constructed by his grandfather, Tutmos II. Only the lintel and four pillars of the chapel and Peristyle Hall remain within the Karnak Temple today. A large section was removed by Tutmos IV's successor, Amenhotep III, during his dismantling of the festival court. The dismantled remains of the rest of this structure, found during modern work at Karnak, have been reconstructed in the open air museum. Many of the recovered blocks still have relief scenes of the king embracing the god of moon, accented with colorful paint. So now it's time for an intermission. Let's take a break. My presentation will be continued in part two. <laughs>